I'm Mike Brown. I'm dean of uh, the Elliott School of International Affairs here at the George Washington University, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Elliott School and the campus of the George Washington University. It's a particular pleasure to welcome this evening's distinguished speaker, Zainab Salbi, to the Elliott School. Uh, the Elliott School is proud to co-sponsor this event with the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, thanks to Dr. Kathleen Kunest, the director of USIP's Gender and Peace Building Initiative, the Institute has organized a stunning three-day conference on women in war. This conference commemorates the 10th anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which recognized the disproportionate impact of violent conflict on women, as well as the critical role that women can and must play in peacemaking. USIP's Women in War Conference is bringing together an extraordinary international coalition of, of participants and experts and the Elliott School is privileged to contribute to this superb program. I'd like to thank Dr. Kunis for her leadership and her partnership on this important program. This evening's event is also sponsored by the Elliott School's new Global Gender Initiative, which was established earlier this academic year under the directorship of Associate Dean and Professor Barbara Miller. As Dean Miller likes to say, the agenda is hers, health, education, rights, and security. The Elliott School's Global Gender Initiative is dedicated to improving the health, education, rights, and security of women and girls and reducing gender-based discrimination around the world. The Elliott School will do this by expanding its research, teaching, and policy engagement programs on these issues. Dean Miller will moderate the question and answer segment of this evening's program. And finally, this evening's uh, program is the latest event in our Distinguished Women in International Affairs speaker series. Now in its fifth year, the Distinguished Women series brings renowned, renowned women leaders to the Elliott School to engage with our students, faculty, alumni, and other members of our academic community on important international issues. Previous speakers in this series include Mira Shankar, the Ambassador of India to the United States, Dr. Helene Gale, the CEO of CARE International, Louise Frechette, former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Milan Vivere, U.S. Ambassador at Large on Global Women's Issues, Renee Jones Boss, the Ambassador of the Netherlands to the United States, and Betty Begumbe, the extraordinarily courageous Ugandan peace activist. A tradition of the Distingu Distinguished Women series is for one of our distinguished students to introduce our distinguished speaker. And in that tradition, it's my pleasure to introduce Erin Ogunki. Erin is from the Philadelphia area, and she is currently a sophomore at the Elliott School, where she is studying international affairs with a minor in history. She is a member of the Delta Phi Epsilon Foreign Service Sorority, and she's interested in studying foreign languages. Indeed, she already speaks Italian and Spanish. She has interned at the Anti-Defamation League, which works to fight racism and discrimination. Erin plans to study abroad next year at Sciences Po in Paris, where she plans to work in anthropology and where I expect she will work on her French as well. Uh, following graduation, Erin would like to teach English in either Africa or Asia before attending law school to study international human rights law. Ladies and gentlemen, Erin uh, Ogunki. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Dean Brown, for your introduction. Um, I would also like to begin by thanking the Elliott School for hosting this event, uh, and for all of you for being here tonight. Um, <clears throat> uh, given the spotlight on women's issues in international affairs across the world, um, especially because today marks the 10th anniversary of UN Security C Council Resolution 1325, which, and I quote, was passed to reaffirm the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace building, and humanitarian response. This is a timely event. While there has been progress on some of the fronts in the fight against oppression of women and the granting of their civil rights and liberties, evidence abounds that much still remains to be done in many countries and in many areas. 
In 1992, thousands of women in Bosnia and Herzegovina were placed into rape camps in which rape and torture were employed as a weapon of war. Since the mid-1990s, and even now, rape is used as a weapon of war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, displacing and destroying the lives of hundreds of thousands of women. In Afghanistan, about 85% of women are forbidden to attend school, are often violently attacked, and prohibited from being involved in most fub most forms of public life. Similar situations have, occur have occurred in countries like Iraq, Kosovo, Rwanda, and Sudan, not to mention nations where violence and structurally enforced discrimination against women remains unknown or unreported. As some governments have continued to, or have, have and continue to ignore severe human rights abuses endured by women all over the world, it is the work of distinguished and influential women, like our guest speaker tonight, Zainab Salbi, that ensures that the plight of many millions of women who remain oppressed does not go unnoticed or unchallenged. Born in Iraq, the daughter of Saddam Hussein's pilot, Ms. Salbi came to the United States when she was 20 years old. Her experiences with the, women, with the suffering of the women in Bosnia inspired her to create Women for Women International at just 23 years of age. Since 1993, her organization has been dedicated to improving the lives and status of women affected by war worldwide, and has helped 271,000 or more women affected by conflict readjust and be begin living normal lives. It has also distributed several million dollars in aid. Mrs. Salby has written two books. One, Between Two Worlds, Escape from Tyranny, Growing Up in the Shadow of Saddam, and the other is The Other Side of War, Women's Stories of Survival and Hope. She has been recognized and received several honors and recognitions. Former President Bill Clinton recognized her for her work in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and he also recently nominated her as one of Harper's Bazaar 21st century uh, heroines. She is the recipient of the 2010 David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Bridging Leadership Award and has received the Forbes Trailblazer Award and Time Magazine's Innovator of the Month Award. Uh, she is also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. She's one of 22 members of the Clinton Global Initiative Lead Program, uh, Initiative Lead Program and is a member of the UN Secretary General Civil Society Advisory Group. She has a master's degree from the London School of Economics uh, and and political science and a bachelor's degree from George Mason University. Ms. Salby's work hits home on a very personal level for me. As I continue my studies here at the George Washington University, I too wish to later dedicate my life and career to international human rights advocacy. And it is women like Ms. Salby who most inspire me to work even harder for those without a voice. On another and more personal level, as a Nigerian American with almost all of my father's side currently residing in Nigeria, I cannot help but feel extra and personal admiration for Ms. Salvi's work in a country so important to me and my family. As citizens in a relatively free society, it is sometimes difficult to remember those who, ha who lack the simple ability and comfort to leave their houses in public without escorts, to feel safe in almost any environment, to live a life free of institutional or societal discrimination, or to simply feel like an equal among the rest of society. However, as members of the greater international community, is it, it is important that we take more time and effort to remember and recognize those who live every day without simple luxuries we often forget we're lucky enough to have. So with no further delay, it is truly an honor and a privilege for me to present to you Ms. Zainab Salvi. First of all, thank you so much for this very kind and very generous introduction. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be in all of your companies today. We have uh, friends of Women for Women International, and I have to say, I have my dearest sisters and heroines here with me from Congo, Rwanda, Afghanistan, Kosovo, <laughs> uh, Bosnia, Sudan, Nigeria, who are our country directors at Women for Women, and it's an honor to be in front of you as well. Thank you so, so much. You know, when I, when I was a child, I grew up in Iraq, 
And it's ironic that you introduced me, the daughter of Saddam Hussein's pilot. It's my, my life work to prove that I am not only the daughter of <laughs> Saddam Hussein's pilot, I am Zainab Selby who works with <laughs> women survivors of all. But I'm trying to work on this issue, so it's good. <laughs> but when I, um, I never forget, there was one night in which I woke up in the middle of the night with the sound of um, a big sound, an explosion that shook everything in my room. I shook my bed, I shook my window, um, and I just jumped out of bed and I looked out of the windows and I saw half a circle of fully exploded, of explosion, light, half a circle. And I remember, I was 11 years old, I remember it's like, this is just like the movies, but it's much bigger than the movies. Um, and I also remember, so I kept on staring at it until it disappeared. And I went back to, it was not far away from my home. And I went back to my bed. And I remember secretly thanking God that it wasn't on my family. That it did not land on my family. And I remember being very ashamed of my prayer. That I was thanking God it was someone else and not us. I mean, until now, I get very emotional thinking about that moment. But I wanted to start with this moment. Well, the next day, I learned it actually fell on my brother's friend, and it killed him and half of his family, but not his mother and his sister. And within a few days, his mother went to my brother's school. He was in elementary school, and she begged all the kids in the class if they had any pictures of him, if they had any toys from him, if they had anything that has that that is of him, so because everything was burnt in the house and she doesn't have pictures. And I wanted to mention that story because often when we talk about war, we talk about it from a very, from a, almost a sterile way, a clean way. You know, we talk about numbers of casualties, we talk about troops, we talk about weapons, but we do not talk about these feelings. We don't talk about what it's really like, what it's really like to see that color of explosion. What is it really like to hear that sound? And, and the sound sometimes is by explosions, um, and it's scary, but sometimes it's the the sound of like the, f the, the birds flying just before they know a missile is going to land. Sometimes it's the sound of kids crying. And sometimes it's actually the sounds of silence where we are all so afraid that you're just holding, catching your breath, what's going to happen next. We, even when we talk about war, which is in our movies or in our games, right, in terms of it gets us some feelings, it doesn't capture not only the color, because we do capture the, the explosions, but it doesn't capture, you know, when, what one Bosnian woman, she's, she's like, it's not only about the lost. It's not only about being raped and being killed and being tortured and losing your home and becoming a refugee. It's, it's about losing the I in me. It's about losing the eye in me because all of a sudden you're completely disarmed from everything you have. You've, or, the, the, or rather, the rug feels like your life has been swept from underneath your feet just like a rug. Over a matter of nanoseconds with things that you have nothing to do with. You did not cause it. You did not participate in this war. But you just paid the biggest price there is. Or a Palestinian woman who said, it's unfair. There should be one life and one death. And it's unfair, she was describing the soldiers in their raids over and over and over again. She said, and every time they come and they investigate and all of that, we feel we're going to die. And it's unfair, there should be, there's only one life and there should be only one death. The fact that we feel we're dying over and over and over again every single day is an unfairness part of it. I do not, I, I, you know... Uh, I do not expect everyone to go and live in war to understand it. That's not a reasonable ask. But I do ask 
that unless we change the debate from that of the numbers and the politics of war and the strategies of war to that that addresses how you actually live in war, what it feels like, our solutions are never going to be comprehensible or, or, or full. Because we're making them from a very, you know, it's making number uh, decisions on only metric space, but not only understanding the num the the, re the emotions of the people. So unless we shift what I would say, what I would argue, and understand war from the other side of war, there is the frontline discussion and there is the backline discussion. There is the troops and the soldiers and the weapons, and there is the schools and the hospitals and the roads and the food. There is what men see of war. This is not a criticism, it's just a fact, the frontline discussion. And there is what women see and lead of war, which is the backline discussion. They are the trenches and they are the bombed houses. And we have and we will never be able to understand wars fully if we are only looking at it from a frontline discussion we must start looking at it from a backline discussion. And it's so relevant not to only our understanding of what war is or what peace is, because often, because of our limitations to only frontline discussion, peace becomes often the ending of fighting rather than the building of peace. And believe you me, ending of fighting, Bosnia, is very different than building peace. I can't look at any of the countries that we work in. We don't have peace, <laughs> not yet. Um, but it's very different concept. Europe is a good example. There is peace, you know, after much fighting. And so you can't have that comprehensive peace discussion if you don't understand the other side of war. And that's where women come in. You see, when women come in in this picture, we only see them as victims, and they are. They are majorly victimized in wars. 80% of the refugees in the, in the world are women and children. 75% of uh, modern war casualties are women and children. Uh, women are usually targeted for rape systematically. From World War II, where you know, Russia invited, um, where Stalin wrote in brochures encouraging Russian soldiers to rape German women and break their Germanic uh, uh, honor, and that led to the rape of 900,000 German women to Bangladesh, 1971, the rape of 400,000 Bangladeshi women by Pakistani soldiers, to Bosnia, the rape of 20,000 Bosnian women in four years in rape camps that had structure and orders, and women were given numbers. And when their numbers were called, they had to go to the other room and get gang raped. This is only 93, 94. 92, 93, 94, to Rwanda, half a million women raped in 94 over 100 year days, and to as we speak right now, Congo, where hundreds of thousands of women are getting raped right now, today. So, it's true, women are victims of war. They pay the biggest price. They have no weapons. It's a good thing. We know that it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, and, and these are debates, actually. I mean, if I, if I may, we were in, con in a refugee camp in Congo a, few, a year ago, and you're so furious at the injustice of it, so furious, that it does occur to your head. It's like, I just know intellectually that arms doesn't work. It's not the way to create uh, peace. I, you just know emotionally and intellectually that this is not to go about it. But so they pay the biggest price. It's their lives, and they cannot do anything about it. So that's one thing. Yes, women are victims of war. They are the highest numbers of victims in the war. But the story does not stop here. And that's our evolution in this country, in this world, in the academy, in the practitioners, because they know it in the field. The story does not stop at their victimhood. The story is an evolutionary story that actually how they stand up back on their feet. And that's the untold story, or if it's told, not enough to change the public perception of what women in war means. So, and so what Rwandese, for example, are often very frustrated that every time anybody mentions Rwanda, we only talk about the genocide in Rwanda. 800,000 people got killed in 100 days, half a million raped, all of that. And they're like, but it's, but, 
no one is talking about how we rebuilt ourselves. And not much attention is given that actually after 16 years, Rwanda is one of the cleanest countries in Africa. Or that is most, one of the most economic development country in Africa. Or that the progress is happening so fast. Why is the world stuck on our history and not evolving with, our, with the story as we have evolved? And it's no different than women. We always stop the story at her rape or at her victimization. And we don't continue the story. But wait a minute, she stood up again and again. And again, despite of that damage that was the, the destruction or the darkness that she has seen. And by God, we have so many women to tell you about or to share the stories about. But, uh, Julian, who's, uh, who the rebels came, killed her husband in front of her and her kids, raped her, cut off her, feet, uh, her, her leg, chopped it in four pieces, asked their kids, her kids to participate in their mother's torture, and when one of them refused, they shot him. He was nine years old. Now I can stop the story here. That's it. Oh, my God. It's horror. When I hear, when she told me the story, it's just, it just feels like it's non-human beings who did that. You know, it's just like Lord of the Rings, the monsters people, you know, who did that. It's just it's so, so absurd that someone would actually do something like that. Is it Lord of the Rings? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about. The, the, yes. <laughs> um, but she went on. And when I met her a few years ago, she was talking about how she started her business, how she had $450, how she's sending all her kids to school, how she has their dream, her dreams for them. She has another home. There's an organized structure. Now, it doesn't mean she finished her trauma. Or it doesn't mean that she's not worried that her children have so much hate in their lives that she's afraid that when they grow up, they will be rebels and they will perpetuate the cycle of violence. That's a different story, but it does mean that this woman did not get stuck on that point and she survived and she, her resilience of standing up despite of that is amazing. We do not talk about women as simple as my mother. Who well, you can look at her and say, oh my God, this poor woman lived in war. You don't know the story. And as the sirens were happening and as the raids were happening and everyone was scared and hiding, my father was more scared from that fighting than she was. I, tr trust me. He was trying to dig trenches in, the, in our own garden. And my mother was playing puppet shows for us so we do not be scared. And we continue to be laughing and all of that and distract us that there is sirens and there are raids and there are missiles landing on our city. That's no one talks about her story. You know, no one talks about, you know, the Rwandese uh, woman that I met, I can't remember her name. She stood up and the curse, she said, I hated, she was a Tutsi, she said, I hated Hutus. No, it's the opposite. Yeah, I hated Hutus. They killed my father in front of me. I was 10 years old. I hated them since that day. I refused to talk to them. I refused to buy from them. I refused to sell to them. I refused to do anything. And I lived my life like this. But I was very poor. And she's a single head of household, all her siblings. She's impregnated as a child or as a teenager. She said, I'm very poor, and I needed to get into this program. And there I go. And the trainer that is training me about, that is going to help me rebuild my life, is a Hutu. So she, she said, the first three months, I just needed the money and I needed the help, but I didn't say a word. I didn't want to speak with that woman. I, and then eventually I realized that this is the very woman who is actually helping me rebuild my life. And that my own, my own past has to be dissolved, has to be resolved, rather, in order for me to be able to go out and stand up again. The courage of someone who says, I had hate in my heart, and now I have transformed that into love. And literally, these were her words as she stood up in front of a whole collective gatherings of women. I had hate in my love, and I, in my life, and I transformed it into love. I love that Hutu woman, because she helped me. That's courage we do not acknowledge 
that transformation, a statement like that, can do not only on these two women's lives, but in everyone who touches their lives and everyone in their communities. So the second part of the story, and I can tell you many, 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 many other stories, you can notice I like storytelling, is we need to understand war from the back line. We need to understand the women who are actually talking about not only their victimization, but we also need to talk about, uh, in, in terms of the big numbers, but we also need to talk about what they are saying. So a couple of examples. We just did a survey of uh, women in the Congo. And this is just to understand the realities. Out of 100 women in the DRC, 52 eat only one meal a day. 77 earn less than a dollar a day, which means usually 20 cents when we are working with them on more details, 30 cents. 66 out of 100 women think of hurting themselves. 80 come from, ref from villages that have been attacked. 75 think that their current villages will be attacked. 50 have spouses who have left them because of the war. 49 are afraid to work outside of their homes. We need to understand, first of all, what is happening in that back line, back line discussion of the war. But the second, we need to understand who is actually keeping life going in this. Who is, who is harvesting and farming, nevertheless, just to keep the food going? And who is carrying the stones, nevertheless, and keeping the schools going and uh, the, the food going? And who is opening the schools every single day? And who is opening the hospitals every single day? And the predominant majority of those people who are women. So there is Farida in Sarajevo, a music school teacher, who despite of the besiege of the city, for four years, people are afraid to get out of their homes. She, the piano teacher with her pearl necklace and very elegant shirt and skirt, and I'm not exaggerating, she's a stereotypical piano teacher, a Russian, you know, beautiful, she went and opened the music school every single day and kept the school open with students playing their cello and the piano and the violin with their gloves and hats and coats. And when you look at her, she says, that's how I am fighting the war. I'm keeping the school open every single day. So we need, first of all, to change the dynamics. There's a frontline discussion of war, and there's a backline discussion of war. And it's important first to understand both of them equally. Why is it relevant? Because the backline discussion is telling us relevant information about how do you create peace and security. Same Congolese women that we just talked about, we just surveyed 2,500 of them, all Eastern Congo, South and North Kivu. They were talking about very simple things. Pay the soldiers. Pay them good salaries so they stop coming and pillaging us and raping us in the process. Make sure that you provide us security so we can harvest our own farms before the, the rebels go from the bush and harvest it before us, leaving us hungry. Basic things. In Iraq, right after the invasion of Iraq, I was in the alleys of the smallest alleys in Iraq, and you meet with women and their sons in front of them, who they say, our sons know how to fight. That's all what they've been trained. Please make sure that someone give them a job before they, before they go and join the rebels because they, they pay so much. They're paying $400 a month. Please tell someone to get these kids a job <laughs> as a civilian before he is tempted and he's, he loses all hope to join any other thing. They are telling, these women are telling information that is relevant to how do you go actually about building peace and security. So we need to understand first the other side of war. They are telling you that we can't talk, we're so afraid of talking if there is no justice system. So here's the ICC, International Criminal Court, is doing investigation in, in Congo, want women to testify, want, but no one is saying, but, but we are getting killed right after we talk with you. We can't go to the police to recommend that because we get killed right after we go and talk with you. So you can't expect us to have this. Now we've just been through this hell. Then you, no one asks, no one's helping us to stand on their feet. And you want us to be even more courageous to now go and speak out. And again, again, you abandon us because you don't provide us security. 
and shelter. And it's, it's you're leaving women in that perpetual cycle that the only way to succeed and to survive is despite of their circumstances, not because of their circumstances. The third thing, the other thing that I wanted to share is that we need to change. Also, how do we go? So there is the understanding, but there is the behavior. We need to change the behavior pattern. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that because obviously most wars in modern time has been outside of Europe and America. And the most of the common discussion that is talked about when you talk about war is cultures. These Afghans have been killing each other for so long. Sunni and Shias hate each other for hundreds of years. Congolese and, you know, uh, I don't know, Hutu and Tutsis, this is a historical uh, fighting. We can't do anything about it. So, you, so what happens is that there is a, a dissolving of responsibility. It's other cultures. We cannot do anything about it. They are doomed to be the way they are. It's the way, it's, it, there's a complete dissolving of responsibility. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it's about action. One is, and I want to use another example to, to explain it. One is, most of the times, and I would argue most of wars are triggered for that has a lot of times and economic reasons behind it. A lot of times. Now, sometimes it's justice as well. But a lot of times that we have to do economic reason. Poverty generate instability. That we can do something about it. We were talking earlier before we came here. Did the wars in Europe stop because there was really political reconciliation and healing? Or did the wars of Europe stop because the incentives not, of not to fight is bigger than the incentives to fight? When you have a comfortable life, you do not want to shake it. You know, a lot of times in America and in Europe, people complain about refugees. And though I'm not legally a refugee, I am someone from another country who has lived here. Let me tell you something, please. It's not fun to be not in your country. It is not fun not to be a refugee. It is not, you feel lonely, isolated, you're not living in your culture, you're not, you don't, you're powerless, you don't speak your language, you don't have your family, your friends, you don't visit your neighbor, you don't, it is not fun. Grateful. But no one wants to choose, usually people don't choose to leave their homes, what I'm trying to say, unless their homes are so, so, so bad that you have no choice. So what we can do something about is, is change that choice making. And that is doable because it's about incentives and it's about building and stabilizing the countries. So a more current example is Afghanistan. How do we win the war in, the war in Afghanistan? Or how do we pull out of the war in Afghanistan? There are two paths. We can kill as many Taliban as possible. possible. I mean, that's military, I mean, it's possible. Or we can say, and maybe, or and, we can rebuild the country that that 18-year-old boy is not tempted to join the Taliban because he wants the job as the guard in the hospital. And that's called nation building, which for some reason is becoming a dirty word in recent politics. And I don't understand it. And coming from war and working in war, there is no way we can, wear, we can win the war in Afghanistan if we do not build the roads and the hospitals and the schooling and make people and create more jobs and stabilities because that's the only way people stop fighting. And we can go ahead and spend billions, how much we're spending, $150 billion, $100 billion on the war in Afghanistan this year compared to $150 million on development. So we can go ahead and spend another $100 billion and another $100 billion and another one, and we will not win it. And we will not stabilize Afghanistan unless you switch the dynamics, unless you actually build enough schools and enough hospitals and enough roads and the incentives for the drug farmer is more to farm apples than to farm heroin. And it's possible to do that.
So there are things that we dissolve ourselves from taking uh, that by saying culture is so there's no responsibility in here and it's not possible. There are things that culture is stuck in it. There are things. I just came from Iraq three weeks and I met two scenarios about girls getting married at the age of 15. One is from a, a girl from a tribal area. True, they don't need money, but her father in a tribal situation is, has decided to marry her off at the age of 15. That's culture, you're right, you're absolutely right. But as an Iraqi, I'm telling you, this happens maybe 10% of the time. Only in very small villages it happens. But that's culture, and that the change happens in that through actually promoting social entrepreneurs and uh, promoting young activists and have them change it. That's the way to change it. But the same example, there were 10 more examples in that same period I was in Iraq where parents married, or mothers rather, married their daughters off at the age of 15 because of poverty. That we can do something about. It wasn't culture. Each one of these mothers wanted their daughters to go to school and actually their conditions of marrying their daughters was for the husband to pay for their schooling. They made the decision because they couldn't afford their food and they couldn't afford their schooling. And it was a choice. I had to marry her off so she can continue. And I can't afford to pay for her. That the whole world can do something about because it's about ending poverty or it's about stability and economic development. When it comes to politics of culture, and that's what I wanted to get more into, is that we, so we make an excuse. It's their culture so that we cannot have women in it but we don't take our own responsibility about women representing this country or the UN or different European countries. And what highlighted it for me, I was once in Sudan and talking and lecturing a Sudanese government member about the inclusion of women and UN Resolution 1325. And you know, I was very passionate about it and he said, please, unless the UN team comes with 50% of women in their own delegation, and unless the European teams do the same thing, and the US team, and the European team, don't talk to us. Because we are tired of you lecturing us when you don't reflect that same numbers that you demand on your own delegations. And so there's a self-accountability in here. That has nothing to do with culture of America, right? That's a culture of, of poli political gender. That's a gender culture that needs to shift. And it is not about saving them in here, there, it's about saving us in here. And it's about holding everyone accountable for decision making and where are the women included and are we including women at the decision making table. So as I'm speaking here and as I am in your, uh, as I'm in your presence, the fact goes that there are actually never been women chief negotiators ever in history in any peace agreement that only 8% of all peace talks included women, that, peace, uh, that only 2.2% of all peace agreements included women. But more dangerously and more urgently, as we speak right now, in Afghanistan, there is a reconciliation process between the Taliban and the Afghan government. And women are one of the agenda items in that reconciliation process. And women are not included in that process. So an, an official who is part of this process, an Afghan official over coffee, rather over tea, in Afghanistan in August told me, women are going to have to pay a price. Don't worry, it's not so much. It's just their appearances and it's just their mobility. Not so much. But this is how, but he said that. But I equally was testifying in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about Afghanistan. And there wasn't that outrage. And I just came from the White House and was like, but there's a lot of development. And yes, Afghan women are part of the parliament. And all of this is true. There's a huge development in Afghanistan. And if anything, women showed us that they can stand up on their feet. And they have voices to say, wow, they have opinions. And they're asking right now to be part of the negotiating and to negotiate for themselves. So it's the elephant in the room that we're, none of us are willing to talk about it because it's, uh, it's happening, Afghans to Afghans. We can impact it by using our political leverage and political will. 
And all the celebration of 1325 and the 10 years anniversary means nothing if there's one group of women in one country being sucked, not one, a whole woman, a whole population of women being sacrificed as we speak today because they are not included in a negotiation that includes them and they are not part of it. So do we have to wait until there is one more woman stoned to death in a stadium to be outraged? Do we really need to see it? Do we have that need to see one more atrocity against one more woman to rally up and stand up in the streets and to say, oh my God, we have to save Afghan women as American women did 10 years ago? Can we become or can we actually be proactively and say, look, it's not happening. There's a lot of progress. There's a lot of them in political representation and all of these things, but we are about to lose that. The whole world is about to lose that and we are part of it right now. Do we need to speak up only when there is a crisis? Or can we speak up when there is, when we, in a proactive way? Do we really only need the victim story to be emotionally engaged? Or can we be as emotionally engaged with the resilience and the courageous woman's story? And that's our evolution in this room. It's not about them. They need help, they've gone through hell, they're standing up on their feet, it's wobbly, sometimes it's very good, sometimes it's not good. God knows we have enough women who have survived hell, uh, 12 months in a rape camp, or in, in a bush being raped over and over again, and she stands up on her feet, and then they rape her again, and she stands up on her feet, and then she goes into the trauma of alcoholism and, and drama. So it's not easy to survive. This is not to make it a rosy thing. But they're trying. It's up to us whether we want to sit and watch and judge other people's cultures and just talk about you and resolutions and what can we do actively, or we actually say, oh, wait, there's Afghan women right now being negotiated and let's do something. So that's the other thing that I want to uh, talk about. The other one is inclusion. So inclusion in negotiations, but inclusion in peacekeepers, in peacekeeping missions. Only three 0.2% of total personnel in all peacekeeping missions includes women. And only 13 out of 34 peacekeepers' missions have gender advisors. These are not radical shifts. You know, to ask every peacekeeping mission in the world to actually say you, have to, should, you should have gender advisors to see about your spending and whether you're actually reaching out it should not be hard. This is political discussions in, in, in wealthy countries. And there is a proof also. So you know all about the Indian peacekeeping troops in Liberia who have contributed to changing the discussion. Now we have higher reporting of violence because they are women that they are reporting to women. Now we have more information in the streets because of the women in the U.S. troops, part of the U.S. troops missions in Afghanistan, going and meeting with other women and getting more information about what I just told you. The men in Iraq are saying, this is seven years ago, unfortunately we didn't do it then, saying, hey, if you're not going to get us jobs, we're going to join the rebels and fight. They're paying us good salaries. You know, so you have more information coming out. There is 65% decline in crime rates in Liberia with, that is associated directly with the, peace, with the women peacekeepers. And there is 15% increased enrollment of Liberian women in the police force as a result because they are role, mo role models that is presented for them. So that's a political action that we can do something about, right? It is in our hands to influence each country's political decision in sending their troops and the representation of women in their troops. The, th the, second th the other thing that I want to talk about is resources. Women have the breadcrumbs of resources. And when, with the breadcrumbs, we fight over it and it's being discussed to cut off. And by the way, do so many different things with these breadcrumbs. So, just as a record, girls, for example, in terms of international development, there is two cents out of every dollar, according to Novo Foundation and Nike Foundation, two cents out of every dollar of international development goes for girls. Yet, there is a direct correlation between actually girls' education 
and the economic growth of that country. Direct, uh, and I don't know it by heart right now. I can't remember, I'm looking at Lyric. I can't remember it by heart. But the direct correlation, the more you educate girls and they go through the education ladder, the more the economic growth of that country there's. But we're spending two cents out of every dollar on girls. Same with, uh, same with uh, different things. Afghanistan, there is a solidarity, uh, the solidarity program that allocates 10% of funds for the local communities to women. So one thing is we are seeing women who are saying, we're not even being included to decide on the funds that is given to us. They're being bullied, and it's like you have to spend it on the, the village thing rather than women's affairs. Or they're saying, actually, you cannot become the decision-making. Yes, this is allocated for women's issues, but we will decide. This is not to criticize the program. The program, in its principle, is excellent. This is to say, not enough. Not enough. We need more. I don't want us to be shy anymore. You know, and right, right after the invasion in Iraq, I was with Iraqi women, and they were trying to say, America came. We now have 50% representation in the government. And few of us who lived in America were like, actually, it doesn't work like this. You don't have 50% representation. They said, yes, 50% representation. We're like, it's actually 9% only in the States. And if you follow 13 resolution, uh, 1325, it's only 25%. So maybe you should adjust your expectations and, and argue for much less. We still, I mean, this is true for, I, I want everyone to hear it because this is true. This is not like women ask someone, and the World Bank was telling me that she asked for a budget of 15%, rather on the UN, and uh, for women, and they said, no, 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 it's too much, 10%. We are talking about small percentages. We are fighting for, can you give us, please, 30%, 25%, 15 okay, I'll take that. You know, but it is, we, are, we, we need to change that. It's about, it's about good resources and good allocations of resources, and I don't want us to be timid about asking for 50% representation in the political force in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in other countries and not be shy and know that it's a process and it's a long process and it will come, but not be shy about that. So we need resources. There's a lot of accomplishments. The UN just had the first entity for women, UN Women. They have to raise half, $500 million. Nowhere near it. That's a political will. How can the UN Women, which is equivalent to UNICEF and UNACR and all of these things, have respected budget so they can do something about it? It's headed now by former Chilean president, Michelle Bachelet, and we were meeting with her last week, and from women from all over the world, and they were saying, please, 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 can we just get more women, more money? These are women at the grassroots level in Liberia, in Nigeria, in so many different countries who are saying, we simply don't even have money to transport ourselves from our community to attend the meeting that is happening that includes us, but no one is telling us how can we actually pay for the transportation, and we don't have money. This is how bad it is when it comes to women. Now, that does not dismiss the celebration that needs to happen because a lot has been accomplished. A lot has been accomplished on a larger level. I mean, for God's sake, what, in the 70s, American women could not have credit cards without the approval of their husbands? Now we may have too many credit cards. <laughs> so there's a lot of accomplishment, and I'm not joking. It's huge, you know? This is self-discipline now, but it's, you know, that, you know but that we actually are living in a world that women are running for presidents one after the other? This was unimaginable, unimaginable in the, sev in, in, in the generations before us. Or that we have, we are discussing a celebration of 1325, or we have the State Department assigning a whole department for women or the White House. This is, so we have a lot of ac accomplishments and don't uh, mistake the accomplishments with saying, the lack of acknowledgement for them. So first, we need to acknowledge the accomplishments. Second, it's not time to celebrate. We are a long, long, long way from reaching actual equality and justice. Third, we need to start looking at the elephants in the room. And some of it is hopefully what I talked about, but I'm sure it's not cohesive process. We need to include men in the discussion. We must include men in the discussion, not to preach to them about how bad they are, but as partners. Because, and this is for the women in the room, we are stuck in our own victimhood. 
And unless we evolve out of that and reach out to men as partners, because there is no way we can change the reality we are living in if we actually don't have a mutual respect. And we need to respect men as much as we are asking them to respect us. And I say that as a woman for women, for the women in here. There's an evolution that we have to get out to, to do our work of, of really looking at men and reaching out. So that's one thing. The second, we have a dialogue. We need to have a dialogue. And I use uh, war as micro microcosm of, the, of, of a regular society. But when we work with men, and Women for Women International has men training program in countries like Congo, what we understand in the process, and this is to achieve or pass through a military commander as men in leadership position, what we're understanding in the process is that no one is reaching out to men. No one is talking with them. No one is engaging with them. And they feel like they are in a vacuum. And the options that you have, you either become a fighter or you become emasculated because you have not fought. And we need just as much as we need to teach women about women's rights and all that, we need to engage men in that dialogue. And it is possible to change. In Afghanistan, we trained 400 imams, religious clerks, about women's rights, who, and they gave their speeches, their Friday sermons about women's rights. Don't think of cultures as statics. They are evolving constantly. And while the tribal leader evolves in different ways and the economic decision that I talked about Iraq, it's possible to change his mind. It's possible. Don't think of it as a black and white issue. So we need to engage men. And frankly, and last but not least, we need to build, or rather, because it has been built, revive a grassroots movement. We need to revive a sense of all of us being engaged in it. As I talk about Afghanistan, I actually think Secretary Clinton is doing her best in raising awareness about, her, about Afghan women's inclusion in the negotiation process. It's, she's really, really trying to do her best. But that does not mean we are all silent. And that does not mean she does not need our help. And that our own screaming outside of the political structure helps the political structure moves the discussions forward faster. Where is, where is our ability, to, where, are, where is our outrage? Where we actually take things in the streets in a positive way, in a, in a, in a celebratory way, but we're saying we care about Afghan women today or Congolese women. Now, it's possible, that was the, you know, it's possible, it's not, it's not dead, but we need to revive it. And this is, this is the audience that revives it, the students in you. The students in you who can actually bring it to the issues and you will only help the president and you will only help the congressman that you like and you can only help Secretary Clinton that you admire by actually speaking loud. You only can hurt the very people you admire by not speaking, by being silent. That's one. But if the women that you're trying to be so passionately about are breaking their silence, you also need to break your own in, in different ways. So in that regard, just because I saw the footage of it today, I ask you for those who want to join Women for Women International in every single, well, this is a new thing, International Women's Day, we ask women to meet on bridges, on your own, has nothing to do with us, on your own. We just, I just saw footage of Congolese women and Rwandese women, two sides that they fight each other, they do not like each other. There's a lot of uh, hurt between the two countries, met on bridges, on a bridge in Congo and Rwanda, and tied their fabrics together and saying, enough is enough, khalas, as we say in Arabic with war, we are demanding the end of it right now. Now, I just learned a story today that one of the Rwandese women who was dancing fiercely, dancing fiercely in the bus from Kigali to, Buka, to Goma was someone who was raped, who they cut her stomach and they left her with the unborn child in her stomach to die. They left her to die. She just simply survived. They killed two 
her two children, she did not know where they killed them and her husband, and she was shaking and crying. And there was this other scene, she's dancing fiercely, and she said, that's my healing, is to stand up that day and say, enough is enough. I don't want to happen. I do not want to see it in Congo. I do not want to see it in Rwanda. I do not want to see it in any more countries. Enough is enough. And for that, I invite all of you to join us by just go, go to our website and learn how to do it. But, but standing up is, is taking your physical space in the middle of the day, not a weekend. And just take your space. Stand up. It's time for us. It is really time for us to be comfortable with who we are as women. And it's time for us to stand up and to speak up. And we've done that. I'm not saying we haven't done that. But it's time to to speak with a louder voice and in beauty. You know, my, my new thing is that if we're not going to change the world by, uh, you know, the armor. Get off the horse. Celebrate who you are as women. And in that process, because it's about building, it's about getting jobs, it's about getting good family care, it's about sending your kids to school, it's about keeping this, it's about actually planting your garden, it's about building. That's what our women, every single woman we work with, and we, I, we work with the most socially and economically excluded women. But I haven't been to any country and I've never been to any woman's home who did not have a garden in her own home, even if it's a couple of flowers. So let's do the change, but let's do it with beauty and with celebration. And let's do the change and let's do it without judgment. And let's do the change and let us do it with looking as much as ourselves and our own behavior as much as the others and other own behaviors, be it that men or women or America and Congo. It doesn't matter. Let's do it, the change and dance in the process as that Rwandese woman has danced and is dancing despite of the horror that she had faced. So for those of you who know me, I'm a big, 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 big Rumi fan. Um, and I, uh, she is literally that poem that I want to tell you today. And she says, dance when you are broken open. Dance when you've torn the bandage off. Dance in the middle of the battlefield. Dance when you are completely free. That's women who've just been cut off and her baby died as she was left with the wound, is dancing physically, literally, she is dancing. And if she can, who are we not to dance in the process? So as we honor the 10 year anniversary of 1325, let us honor everyone who has led that and let everything that we have accomplished today, the fact that 50% probably of the college population in here is women. But it is not time to say it's enough. It's not time to rest. There is a lot more to do. And let us not make the, last ten, the coming 10 years as slow as the last 10 years has been. Let us expedite. And it's up to each one of us to expedite it. So thank you very much. And may we dance, dance until the end. and your inspiration. We have time for a few questions before the reception and then you'll be able to mob her and dance mm -hmm. and do everything. Um, if you have a question, please stand, say who you are, and um, wait for the mic to get to you. Over here. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Shahla Alkali. I am advisor as uh, in Kurdistan region Parliament, Iraq. First of all, uh, she's a very good example <laughs> to go out of the wars and embargoes and what happened in Iraq. We have such people in general, whether women or men, and we have such women. 
I know she worked a lot in Africa and Kosovo, and I'm sure I'm, I, I know about her organization in Iraq. We have lots of women who get up again and have such mentality inside Iraq nowadays, working within such challenges that we have in Iraq. Thank you so much for not only representing women, but also to represent Iraq and Iraq women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's, you know, I want to say two things about that. First of all, thank you very, very much, and thank everyone here. Um, two things, which means personally for me a lot, and politically I want to ask each one of you to, to consider. Personally, um, I, you know, all my life I was so afraid that if I told anybody that I was the daughter of Saddam Hussein's pilot and I knew Saddam Hussein and I actually saw him every single year in my teenage life and we really, and it was, he was my life and he is my boogeyman and, but I called him Ammu, I called him uh, uncle. He's not related, we were forced into this relationship but that's a long time. <laughs> but you know, uh, so I was so scared. I was so scared that if I told anybody, they will stop seeing me and they will stop and they will only see Saddam. And I was particularly scared of Iraqis, that if I tell anybody, because he's a bad guy, he's, he's done a lot of bad things. Um, he's really evil, in my opinion, you know, that if I, if I say that and that I wrote my memoir and I broke my silence. And in the process, my father's friends, old men who came women, my mother's friends, but people I don't know, I don't know you, who are saying, well, you didn't say, but, but it just generally, they's like, thank you for breaking your silence. And if there's anything I want to share, I mean, because particularly you are a Kurd and you face so much horror from Saddam, is speak up. And three quarters of the fear is actually here. <laughs> It's so funny, I couldn't speak about that without crying and now I'm laughing. 90% of the fear is here. So speak up and that you'll see that people are actually much more loving than one think of. So in that, it's, it's thank you. But the other part, which is related to what we, not who we are, but what we are going through is, I was in Iraq literally three weeks ago and I met, after 20 years of not knowing her whereabouts, the, now a woman, but the girl who I grew up with in the same household for all my life, almost all my life. I was five when she came to our home as a housemaid um, at the age of seven. So it was child labor. Um, and culturally, in my family, they sent her to school, da da da, so they thought that they're a good employer, but then they loved her, but she was second class citizen, maybe third in our home. So I'm just being very transparent. And, and we left our home the same country, the same year. She left after she graduated from high school. I left to come to America. She left with her job to go to, uh, with, at the receptionist at the airport. Uh, she left, my, you know, and fell in love with her neighbor, who she married soon, and my mother gave her her wedding dress. And she left as a middle, uh, as emerging from very poor family to lower middle class family. Her husband was really nice. He owned electronic shop and all of these things. But I'm telling you the story because it's uh, another urgency for Iraq. It's an, it's already a forgotten story, Iraq, and it's only been this year, you know. So she. Um, four years ago, her husband got killed in the Shia Sunni thing. She become an internally displaced person, and she becomes a member of Women for Women International. Out of 28 million people in Iraq, we work with only 2,000 at Women for Women International. She's one of them. And I meet her because she talks about her letter. You know, we have a sponsorship program. We ask every single woman to sponsor a woman, a survivor of war, and send her $27 a month, along with a letter to start communication link between the two women. So she is part of this program, then that teach her about her women's rights and teach her vocational and business skills, and she graduates and she gets a job. And she's basically writing, when I grew up, she just told you what I told, what she wrote about what I just told you. And I wanna go back to her story because we just left Iraq. America just left Iraq, right? But Radia is an internally displaced person, one of I don't know how many millions of IDPs in Iraq, living in two mud homes. This is someone who actually had a good life in the last 20 years. 
she she's one of the ones who married all her daughters as teenagers because she couldn't afford to feed them. And there are millions of other women like her. And there's one thing to leave Iraq militarily and quite another thing to take a responsibility for partially what we have caused. As my aunt says, America did a lot of bad things in Iraq and did good things, but we also did bad things, and she's talking to as an Iraqi to me. So partially, I say, not fully. But the country is destroyed, and there is no acknowledgement of responsibility that we need to do more. And in this time, it's not military, but it's an economic investment in the country so it can stand on its feet. And that can be another forgotten story, already a forgotten story. So I want to thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, my name is Amy Farnsworth. I'm actually a student from Brigham Young University, and I'm here on an internship. Um, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, back at BYU, I work on a project called the Women's Stats Database, and we collect information cross-nationally about um, anything that has to do with women. And I feel um, this strong um, satisfaction in collecting this research because I feel like it's it can be very beneficial. Um, and just with your experience, do you think, I mean, what, what might be the best way um, to use that research to make the change? Do you think it would be bringing that research before the government and the UN, or would it be better to start with, like, the grassroots movements and the civilians? Um, Both. Research, are, I mean, that, that's the evolution of the women's discussion, because we used to... Up until recently, it's much more, you know, we talk the, uh, the change from an emotional standpoint. And I look at what happened with Goldman Sachs as an example, for example. Not what happened to them financially, because I don't understand that part of the world. But what had them, what happened in with the, when they launched 10,000 women. So Goldman Sachs research department noticed, not with a gender agenda or a gender lens, noticed the connections between Japanese women's engagement fully in the economy, in, in economic uh, activities with the Japanese economic growth. Just noticed that. And they brought it up to their leadership. And they said, there's a correlation between Japanese women and, and, and their economy, and the national economy. And then they start looking at other countries, and they saw, start seeing the, different, the same pattern. And so when the CEO of Goldman Sachs talks, he says, we are a, you know, a company about prediction, predicting the future. And our research showed us that the future relates women to economic growth. So we have to do something about it. So they, as a result, they created, you know, so again, they created 10,000 women, which is to train women to get not only in microcredit, because every, at this point when you talk about poor women, everyone says, oh, you're doing microcredit for program for women, which is really good. And it's been one of the revolution of the last, revolutionary change, rather, of the last century that, oh, when you give women loans, they actually pay it back. But we can't stop in that line of discussion. We have to get more women at small and medium enterprises. And we have to get more credit available for them and more, more skills available for them. So what Goldman, you can look at what Goldman did as an example. Their research led them to take actions. Them being who they are, their actions is to actually say, we need more women in small and medium enterprises, and they need skills and they need capital, and they need access. So we're going to give them that. And they went to countries that they work in, and they went to countries that they don't work in. But the fact that Goldman, who they are, by their identity, speaking about that, changed the discussion and moved it forward, whether they knew it or not, whether they intended it or not. And again, I'm looking at it from a gender lens in here. And, and I want to add, because it's research is so important in this case. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, Exxon wants to do something about women, and so-and-so wants to do something about women, and this one, and it be it's becoming a popular thing. We're finally popular. <laughs> the, the, you know, the issue is how to not to settle for little right now. The issue is actually about pushing for more, not to be happy with the breadcrumbs. That's the issue right now. And so research made all the difference in that case. So I say use it and use it fully to prove that this is not you know, us talking emotionally about it, but this is us talking factually. But don't forget the emotions in the process. Head-heart combination, that's the feminine way.
Don't forget, don't only wear your suit and forget to wear your skirt in the process and be proud of it. But seriously, you know, that's what we bring into the table, our own skills. So how do you do the research and keep and keep it the front line and the back line of every of every fact? So but that's how change happens. Somebody's pointing to somebody saying that they desperately have to ask a question. Who's that person? The person in the back. I can't say the lights make it almost impossible to see anybody out there. My name is Agnes Dimanja, and I am from Democratic Republic of Congo. I would like to thank you for your job on the ground. But uh, my uh, worry is about what you say, that uh, we, you can fix what happened in Congo. Maybe I had a bad understanding. You can't? You said you, no. We can't fix what happened. No, we have to fix what happened. Okay, happens in thank Congo. you. No. Thank you. No, no. Because uh, the rape is not uh, uh, Congolese uh, uh, culture. No. I agree. And you know it. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, true, it's time. Enough, it's enough. It's time to stop this situation. Yeah. But to stop this situation is like that uh, uh, someone is sick. You have uh, to give a good diagnostic, to give a proper cure. That is the situation in Congo. No. Because for a long time, we were, uh, you know, um, outside of the root and the origin of this situation. You, you, uh, you spoke about uh, the economic war in Congo. And without the involvement of all these multinational and all these uh, uh, companies who are involved in looting uh, mineral in Congo, we will never have uh, uh, peace in this country, never. But I think we can have peace in this yeah. country. We really have, and yeah. it takes few things. So first of all, I th want to introduce you to my colleague, Christine Karumba, who is an amazing, amazing woman and a sister from Congo. Yeah. Um, I think if Afghanistan is urgent in, in, the in the fact that the negotiations are right now, Congo is a crisis yeah. that we must all, all, scream about because it should not be acceptable that as we speak right now women are treated the way they are treated i fully agree i fully fully agree that uh, rape is has not been part of congolese history or culture and that it has come in with the war yeah and it, it's in danger right now of it's you know that people get used to it and we have to stop it and that so it takes me to the third point is about political will the UN knows the 40 men who are arming the Congolese uh, militias and all the different ones. They know the five men who are the top leadership. They know their flights. They know their cell phones. And I'm not telling you because of rumors. I actually talk to people who says, we know them. We know who they are. I was like, why don't you arrest them? It's like, there's no political will to arrest them. Who arrests them? Belgium or, you know, which country? You know, where, where or Rwanda or Congo, whatever it is. There is no, it's about political will. So we can talk about as many UN resolutions as we can. At the end of the day, it takes the courage to say this is wrong and we're going to do it. And the international community has not had the courage yet to look at Congo in the eyes and say, we're going to have to do something about it. But I think there's a lot of discussions. And I, am, I always believe I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I would not work with, in wars. I'm an optimist that uh, the possibilities of change are plentiful, inshallah. Before we thank you, and I, I think we can't take any more questions, I would like you to, don't you have several of your country reps here? Could we recognize? Them in yes. the if you can stand. stand up, because they are the teachers that I have.
and I'm not exaggerating in saying they are the teachers. Each one, they look very beautiful, you know. And, uh, you know, but the, 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 what they go through, these women, just to survive every day, just to conduct the work and deliver the services every single day, is uh, miracles. And so it is, they are real heroines and real teachers, and I am grateful for you. As someone who's studied global security issues for a long time, I, I, I often tell people I, I study the causes of war so I can promote the cause of peace. It's a two-part proposition. And one of the many important lessons that you conveyed this evening, Zainab, is, is another two-part proposition. Uh, women are the leading victims of war, but they're also the leading vectors of peace. And, uh, and that's a, a lesson that we need to keep studying and, and keep telling people uh, uh, about. Uh, the glass is not yet even half full when it comes to women in war, uh, inclusion, resources, uh, progress and peace. Uh, the glass is not yet half full. But thanks to you, uh, thanks to your fellow leaders, uh, the glass is filling up. And I'm glad you ended on an optimistic note because I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because of great schools like this and great leaders like you. And on behalf of my fellow students, uh, I'd like to present you with this small Thank token you. of our very great appreciation Thank and you. admiration. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you.